So we have concluded our arguments from natural theology in support of theism, and now we're responding, as I said, to atheological objections. Here's our roadmap for tonight. We are going to discuss the development of the problem of evil, kind of the overall structure, the things you need to know before you start digging into it. That we're going to discuss the deductive argument uh, of the problem of evil, the deductive version of the problem of evil, and then the probabilistic argument, also known as the inductive or the evidential argument. I'm going to call a lot of attention to this. I forgot to change the title of the slide and we've got like three or four of these. So at the top of each one of these slides, it's gonna say premise one, at least some objective moral facts exist. That was last week. Please go listen to that. It's still true, or is it? Uh, please go listen to that meeting. Uh, it'll be on YouTube soon enough. Um, but we're discussing the problem of evil. Uh, and what we've been doing this semester is Here's something that Alvin the atheist might say. We're trying to come up with some good responses that Carol can pull out of her back pocket in a, in a quick minute, in a quick second, with um, just some, some basic level of preparation. So Alvin will say, good and evil cannot possibly, sorry, God and evil cannot possibly coexist. That would amount to a contradiction. This is the only claim from Alvin that we're going to be investigating tonight. Um, obviously, atheists can and do say a much wider range of things than what Alvin is saying here now, but tonight we want to, to, to zero in on this particular objection. Uh, and Carol might say something like this. I'm sorry you are experiencing whatever evil in your life that you're facing right now, but if you trust in Christ and you depend on the church and he will, he will be your comfort and he will be your aid. And that, that's true. I would say that to a friend. I would say that to my Christian friends. Um, I would pray for them and I would try to give them all the support that they needed and that I could. Uh, but that's not what Alvin was talking about. That's not what Alvin was looking for. And this is where we need to make a distinction between a existential or emotional problem of evil when you're experiencing evil or suffering, then you you feel like you need an explanation. Um, I, uh, it, it, there are profound uh, evils and sufferings that, that people can experience that um, are, need to be acknowledged and so, sometimes you need special training to deal with. And in fact, if somebody is dealing with those things, you don't want to bring them premises because that's not really going to help them. Um, we're going to be talking about an intellectual problem, the deductive problem of evil. You can analyze it um, and you can read about it and you can study it uh, without, regardless of whether you're, ex you're experiencing evil um, and regardless of whether or not you're, you're looking for answers for that. We're also going to delve into the probabilistic problem of evil tonight, just a little bit. So Carol might also say, God only punishes the wicked. And so if you are experiencing evil, then you aren't trusting in and following God. Otherwise, you would be prospering. You're, you might not hear that. I, I don't think so. I really, and not just Job. I, I would include a lot more books in there, but definitely she hasn't read Job. Uh, I don't think you'll hear this too often, but uh, there, are, there are some pastors uh, and, and they'll generally be lumped into something called the prosperity gospel. I just wanted to throw this out here that this is a truly despicable, uh, intellectually dishonest, and uh, awful thing to hear or say. And if you hear it, then don't expect anything more from, from that conversation. So Alvin might say, God and evil cannot possibly coexist. That would amount to a contradiction. And then Carol, in all of her infinite wisdom, will say, or does it? The great thinker known as Samuel the Humongous has evaluated that claim and found it to be lacking for the following reasons, which I'm about to cover. Uh, okay, one final clarification. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. Um, we are just talking about a defense from the logical problem of evil. We are not discussing a theodicy. A clarification I will make again next week, but a defense is just about 
rooting out a contradiction and determining whether or not it holds water. Is there indeed a, a logical contradiction within the premises? So it's only concerned with the argument. It's not even really concerned with theology as a whole, and it's not really concerned with biblical studies. It, it has fewer constraints, and it's less ambitious. Theodicy actually tries to explain the way things are. Uh, the most famous statement of the problem of evil in history, I would say, comes from David Hume, who claims to be, or is, who is quoting Epicurus, uh, or summarizing, if you will. He says, is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then from whence comes, then from whence comes evil? And just reading through that, I'm sure we can all appreciate that there is what's called a, a prima facie, uh, there, there's tension in those claims. Uh, and it seems that perhaps evil does pose uh, a contradiction to the existence of God. How can they coexist? So here's what David Hume said, kind of broken down into a, a very elementary syllogism. If God exists, then God is omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect. Evil exists, therefore God doesn't exist. Now, like I said, this has some initial weight, but it doesn't actually have uh, the contradiction spelled out within the premises. So you need to kind of, uh, th this is kind of the historical classical version, but in order to actually engage with it, we need to expand upon it. This is one possible expansion of that problem. I think it is a pretty good representative, but if you have heard, uh, if you, if you have heard other premises supplied in these blanks and you want to bring them up, we can try to tackle those at the end of this presentation. Um, or if you object to the particular way that these premises were formulated, please raise your hand. Um, so if God exists, then he is omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect. If God exists, he would want to create a world with no evil. If God exists, he would be able to create any world he wants. Evil exists, therefore God doesn't exist. Um, and this is a, this does have the contradiction kind of spelled out. It, it does follow from these premises. But the question is, are these necessarily true? Are, are premises two and three necessarily true? The reason why the word necessarily is bolded is because if they aren't, if they're only possibly true, then there isn't a contradiction. Um, yeah. Uh, contradictions come from more, from stronger statements. Um, and J.L. Mackey in 1955 uh, claimed in, indeed that there was a logical contradiction between evil and God and that religious people or theists could not hold these two ideas together. And then things kind of changed. In 2011, Alvin Plantinga was interviewed on the local news about AC troubles he was having. And after and due to this appearance, he rose to prominence in the realm of philosophy and was widely regarded as an expert in the problem of suffering due to the aforementioned AC troubles. It was a glorious moment. No, I'm kidding. There was a, there was a news clip where Alvin Plantinga was, was interviewed for a local news clip, not about philosophy. The, the anchors and the, and the reporter had no idea who he was. It was a rather humorous incident. Uh, so Plantinga is, is a well-respected philosopher um, who was um, uh, published a lot from 1980s to 2015, even. Um, and now he's, he's pretty old. Uh, he has, uh, he studied at Calvin College and no Notre Dame, sorry, in Harvard, and he has taught at Calvin and Notre Dame. Uh, and this is a popular level book, which I recommend quite highly regarding this problem and, and, and a general overview for the problem of evil. And he has some more scholarly, rigorous, and thorough books 
uh, God and Other Minds, and The Nature of Necessity, which come highly recommended. Not from me, because I haven't read them. So with that out of the way, we can kind of move on to the argument itself. We, we already laid out the argument, but now we need to delve into its premises. Um, whenever you combine, uh, here's the claim, that whenever you combine the reality of evil and suffering and necessary facts about theism, that you produce a logical contradiction. Uh, and as we kind of discussed last week, if you have a logical contradiction, epistemic norms, or an epistemic fact, is that you should not hold contradictory beliefs. I uh, just, just wanted to, to bring a little bit of last week into this week uh, to, to remind us um, this is a serious problem. If indeed a lo logical contradiction bears out, then we can't hold these two ideas. So the reality of evil and suffering is not a hugely disputed point. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy is the founder of a movement called Christian Science, and that is, it's a rather strange uh, belief system. Uh, th but they just say that evil and, uh, and suffering are illusory. They seem real, but they are not. Uh, another thing is a moral nihilist isn't necessarily able to talk about the existence of evil, per se, uh, but they are still able to talk about suffering, and they are also still able to talk about evil from the perspective of the theist. So they can say, I don't really believe in evil, I also don't really believe in God, unless you're a moral nihilist who also believes in God. That's neither here nor there. Uh, so they, they don't believe in either of those things, but they can still say, these two beliefs produce a contradiction, and they can still make that criticism. Um, and then another thing that may be relevant, or you know, probably is relevant to, to many discussions of the problem of evil, is defining evil. And the general Christian definition, the general Christian claim, is that it's actually a, a negative existence, sort of like a bullet hole, or pants without pockets. Wait. Um, <laughs> to where there's something missing that should be there. Uh, so evil doesn't actually have any existence on its own. It's only defined relative to some substance and some proper way of things. Uh, and then finally, just to put this aside, no Christian is going to deny that there is such a thing as evil and no Christian is going to deny that there is such a thing as God. So uh, even if, uh, so we don't have to, delve too deeply into this side of the argument. The nature of God is also relatively more controversial, but relatively uncontroversial, at least in these three aspects, that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. These the three omni qualities. Omni means all, and then potent means power, ishent uh, means knowledge, and benevolent, of course, means benevolence. And we have discussed objections to these qualities in the past. Primarily last semester when we were dealing with the conquest of Canaan, we discussed scholars who have denied the omnibenevolence of God. And I encourage you to go back and listen to those videos to hear our responses. But we're going to hold all three of these claims. We're going to hold all three of these here at Russia Christie for the sake of the argument and, of course, because that's where... We stand on that issue. Uh, I do want to clarify omnipotence. Uh, could, uh, Homer says Jesus, uh, could Jesus microwave a burrito so hot that he himself could not eat it? Uh, this is the way that my high school teacher said it, but you might be more familiar with the formulation, could God make a rock so big he couldn't lift it? Uh, can God do something that... Um, seems if, if there was something that God couldn't do, then he would no longer be omnipotent. And um, basically, this is not a serious problem. This is not a serious question. Most theists will just say, no, God can't, uh, because that would be logically contradictory. Omnipotence only extends to things that are logically possible. 
Uh, so if God is, by definition, omnipotent, he can't, he can't do anything that would, he can't make anything or heat up a burrito that would leave the realm of his omnipotence. Uh, Descartes does happen to be uh, an exception to the rule, and he would say that God can do the logically impossible. Um, but we're not going to talk about that tonight, but don't worry, we are going to spend three meetings on it next semester. No, no, Descartes, we are not really going to, to do that. At least I don't think, we haven't really planned our meeting next semester. If you want to hear three meetings, then let us know, and we'll ignore you. Uh, so with these omni-qualities, uh, we also have to supply the additional premise uh, that from where the contradiction comes. Uh, sorry. So the two premises, which I've combined into one point here, uh, if God exists, he would want to create a world with no evil, and he would be able to create any world he wants. Uh, just to reiterate the idea of a, of a logical contradiction, because that's, that's really important for making sure that we, um, we don't miss the point here. Um, if, a, if we say all squares have four sides by definition, and we say x is a circle, then we know that it is impossible for x to be a square. Well, how do we know that? It's, do I have that in the slide? Um, no. It's because the definition of a circle is that it has no sides. It is the set of all points equidistant from one point in the center. Um, so the definitions are logically contradictory. Um, and there can be no overlap between a circle and a square. No, no definitional overlap, because obviously these two shapes are overlapping in the picture I have here. Um, and then a logical defense just involves demonstrating that there is no uh, contradiction. So if we say all swans must be white, um, Necess then we're saying that if a bird is a swan, then it is white. And then if we point out a black bird, then from the first two premises, we, we know that it is impossible for bird B, uh, big bird, for example, no, to be a swan. But if we just replace the first premise with something more accurate, uh, most swans are white birds, but also that it's possible that some swans are black, and we know that bird B is a black bird, then it's possible that bird B is a swan. We have um, defended the claim that bird B is a black swan from uh, the claim of a logical contradiction. So, are these two claims necessarily true? Uh, any thoughts? Do, do they seem like they're, they're necessarily true? Whatever, sorry, go ahead. It seems like three might be necessarily true because if God is omnipotent, then creating any world he wants, as long as it's logically possible, that would be true. That Very interesting that you say that. It's sort of an interesting word, this omnibenevolence, because you know, all knowing and all powerful are one thing, but all good, and we're trying to apply that all good in a different way. Hmm. Um, I suppose that by supplying the contradiction in terms of two premises, there are three distinct possible defenses that we could be examining here tonight. One would be the defense which comes from uh, rejecting or modifying premise two. One would be the defense that comes from rejecting or modifying premise three. And then third would be the defense that comes from rejecting or modifying both. Um, but interestingly, we are, um, uh, th there, there is a book I'd say that uh, we, we read in a Thomistic Circle reading group. It was a great experience, I highly recommend it, that examined 
the question of what does it mean for God to be good, and it denied that we could say anything like God is morally good like a person is. Uh, we uh, won't touch much on it because although I read it, I do not trust myself to summarize it very clearly. Um, please uh, contact somebody at the Thomistic Institute, at the local Thomistic Institute probably. Not, don't, don't go to DC or anything. Uh, but especially um, uh, Ben Hellyer um, will be able to talk with you about that. So I would say that premise two seems to me uh, the less controversial one, that God wants a world with no evil. Um, and in fact, uh, does things in order to, at least uh, uh, as Christians understand him, uh, does things to eliminate evil in the world. But that's, I, I would say we can say that it's not logically necessary for God to prioritize creating a world with no evil because it's possible to have contradictory, not contradictory, I said contradictory, um, but two different sets of desires that um, just don't come true at the same time. The classic analogy for this is between parents and children. If a parent gives a child both a task or some responsibility or some prohibition, but also gives the child autonomy, then they are setting forward two things that th they desire, both of those things, but it's possible that uh, giving the child autonomy would mean that, they're, that they, the chore doesn't get done, the task doesn't get done, or the pro prohibition is violated. The reason I bring that up is just to illustrate that you can have multiple sets of desires. And I think uh, it comes up fairly often that the same is true of God. So the premise that Alvin Plantinga attacks um, a bit more directly is, can God create any world? He can create any world that's logically possible. Um, and as we saw on the last slide, um, although he wants a world with no evil, he may have other priorities and other desires. For example, um, the allowing of free will. And the argument that Plantinga puts forward is that once you have a world with free will in it, you have restricted the range of worlds that you can actualize <laughs> uh, because you have um, put other people in that world who are co-actualizing the world with you. Um, so God cannot allow free will while simultaneously controlling and deciding every action because that is a contradiction in terms. Now I should once again mention that uh, there are competing definitions of free will and if you are a Thomist who happens to agree with Brian Davies, um, then you might uh, have a different definition of free will, um, which essentially says that God is directly responsible uh, God for the act. He, he directly creates the action of every person. So if I pick up a mug of coffee, I myself freely chose to pick up that mug of coffee, but God is the one who created the action of me picking up that mug of coffee. I may very well be butchering this point, uh, and I hope to hear from uh, my Thomas friends with a clarification, but that uh, puts you in a completely different ballpark, uh, and so we're going to stay more local, I'd say. So what we can s So I, I have a question. Yes. So you said that God can create any logical possible world, logically possible world, but then you said he can't create worlds in which free creatures behave certain ways because they have to co-actualize that with him. 
but doesn't that mean that he can't create all logically possible worlds? Uh, I should say that he can create he can create the world with the free creatures, um, and he um, he knows what they will do, but he himself isn't the one creating all of the things that they've done. And so, uh, it's, it's uh, not easy to summarize. I think I have a... What say is he's indirectly responsible, not directly responsible, like you were saying Brian Davies acts like. Um, so he's He's indirectly responsible for creating free creatures, but not for the things that free creatures do. Yes, but uh, if he creates a world with me in it, me as a free creature, um, then he can't also create a world with the version of me in it who behaves in a uh, particular way. Uh, the version of the world he created with me in it is um, the one in which I have free will. Um, so in other so words, God can't create free creatures and then make them freely choose to do something. He can make them do something like a puppeteer. He can create them free, and whatever they choose, that is what will happen. But he can't create them and then leave them both leave them free and somehow force them to end in the position that he wants them to end in exactly and so by creating free creatures he has uh embraced a world that perhaps um doesn't go the way he wants it in one set of meaning so well, there's, i mean there's... more directly so god creates a world it has a free creature. The free creature does an evil act. There's now evil in the world, but God created a world with a free creature in it. So the only way to avoid the evil act is to make it not a free creature anymore, right? So the logically possible world that God creates, if it's logically possible that God creates a, a world full of free creatures, what they do with their free will, by definition, is not within his control. It is like beyond... The the, yeah, yeah. Um, and he can he can do that. He can make that act of creation um, uh, he, because he wants free will, even if he doesn't want evil. So this is I was trying to avoid saying this word for word because it was on this slide. So it is possible that God cannot instantiate any possible person containing the property always freely does what is right. Um, if, if you create a person with that property and free will, it, that, that, that simply might not be possible. Um, now, at the same time, God could have created a world full of free creatures, and it is possible that they always choose the good, but um, it is equally possible that every possible world contains creatures who choose e evil. Um, and, and the reason why both of those are possible is just because of the, the definition of free will creatures. Um, and he says, and since Mackey's project is to prove an entailment, he cannot employ any contingent propositions as added premises because a contingent proposition would avoid the logical contradiction. Um, so, the so, wait, so if I understand this correctly, then so God creates a free creature, but whatever that creature does with their free will is completely contingent, right? So, like creature A does an evil act, but that evil is that's not it's not necessary. They don't have to do that evil. It's not necessary they do it, and it's not God making them do the evil. And it's not entailed by God existing. So it's just one of those things that happens to be the case. 
So if it's not a necessary truth in and of itself, and if it's not necessarily entailed by God's existence, then it's it's not a, a logical contradiction. Is that kind of the point? Yes, and and you you touched on something. So I I, I had a lot of trouble understanding this, as I'm, as I'm sure I'm demonstrating. But whenever I approached it from the other way around, it made a little bit more sense to me, which is that it is not necessarily true that God can create free creatures who always choose the good. So like Zach said, when God creates a free creature, both their decision to choose good and their decision to choose evil are both contingent possibilities, are both contingent actualizations of the world. And so neither of them can be necessarily true. Um, and so... It, it can't be true that God can create a world with, it can't be necessarily true that God can create a world with free will creatures who always choose the good. And since that can't be necessarily true, uh, the, the uh, problem of evil has failed to demonstrate a contradiction. So, oh, but, I mean, you're saying it fails like as a mathematical demonstration. It could certainly still be the case though. Right. Uh, that you know, people do a bunch of evil stuff, but it's like mathematical necessity. It's not a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And it's also that people do a bunch of good stuff. Um, it's also logically possible. Wait, wait. We still haven't actually shown. Okay. All we've done here is suggested that there. Uh, suggested that it might not be possible for God to create creatures with free will without allowing evil to exist. That, in and of itself, does not fix the free will defense because God could have chosen not to create creatures. So, so well, yeah, what if I just say, yeah, and if God was good, he wouldn't have created creatures because that would have, been, that would have entailed the possibility of evil. Right, so the... Uh... The second component of the free will defense is the statement of, of the, the overriding value of creatures with free will. Um, and uh, this is a uh, difficult premise to uh, deny outright um, because uh, it's also a difficult premise to defend in terms of more sub-premises and whatnot. Most people generally just appeal to the, I suppose, uh, th th there's a sense of lacking in a world full of automata. Um, and there's something valuable that we see in our own free will. And whenever it is taken or infringed upon, we, we understand the value of free will, at least in our own case. Um, so the, the fact is that it's logically possible for God to have a, a prevailing priority that allows for the existence of evil. Um, and, and so long as that is a logical possibility, and so long as it is logically possible that all creatures um, fail to do the good at some point, then um, I, I think we have successfully uh, made the case for the free will defense. The contradiction is supposed to be God makes a creature, creature does evil. You now have a world where God exists and evil exists. Yeah, so well, remember the premise. Remember the premise in the in the original problem was that God would create a world without evil. So uh, God basically, what we're wants saying is to. We're, we're denying that claim. We're saying that God may create a world with evil if it has some other feature that is kind of counterbalancing. Yes. So for example, if if the value of having free creatures is high to God, that can outbalance the fact that there will likely be produced evil 
if he creates legitimately free creatures. Well, um, not, not even that. It just has to be possible. Exactly. If, if there's, it doesn't have to be actually valuable to God. It doesn't have to be objectively good. It is possible. That. Exactly. And even if we um, take a world... Um, we don't have to apply this defense to our understanding of this world in every case. Um, we can just ask, is any world with any amount of evil um, going to be contradictory? And it seems that when we uh, use this defense, it seems pretty clear that some evil and suffering can coexist with God. And whenever we get to next week, one of the questions we'll be asking is, does it scale to the amount of evil that we see in the world as it is? I have gone very, very quickly. Uh, I'm, 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 not at, uh, I'm not at the end of my slides by any means, but uh, I'm certain that I have um, glanced over something that somebody is hoping for to, to delve a little bit deeper on. I, for one, found, uh, so the, the technical term that Plantinga uses to defend um, this claim that it is possible that there are no worlds which God can actualize with both free will and creatures who always do the good, um, he call, he, that claim is called transworld depravity. Um, and I, I would I would do some more research into it um, because it's inherently um, difficult to consider what sorts of things are not possible. But don't consider it as as something that God. It's it's absolutely beyond God's possibility. It's not a hard fast set rule. Um, that's kind of confusing the words um, possible in, in the technical sense as, as opposed to necessary, possible, necessary, and contingent versus um, possible or plausible. Um, so, so long as it is not necessarily true, so long as it um, is not necessarily the case that God can create uh, free creatures who always choose the good, which, once again, a Thomist would say that that is necessarily the case because God is the one and only source of all existence. But I would say a slightly more common sense view of free will suggests that that is not necessarily true. Um, just because we're throwing the words out so much, we should maybe let's talk just real briefly about these technical terms, necessary and possible, because they're not, uh, they're not the same words that we use in ordinary language, and you're using them in the technical sense. Like every time you say necessary, you're meaning this in like the modal logic sense. Um, so maybe it would be uh, valuable to just briefly explain what you mean by that. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm glad you say that because I neglected to put in a slide with this distinction explicitly, but it, I think these two slides about the black swan and the square and the circle demonstrate it pretty well, at least implicitly. Um, I, I think it's easier to start from, a ne from defining a necessary truth. Um, so the, the things, the sorts of things that we can say are necessarily true are, for example, the conclusions of a valid syllogism. Um, so if every single premise of a deductive syllogism is true, then the, the conclusion is necessarily true. Uh, we have used quite a few syllogisms over the course of the past uh, four weeks now. Um, and one, the one that is most commonly brought up is that Socrates is a man. Um, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. 
um, that is, is a necessarily true conclusion given the premises. The definition of a circle is generally, or of a triangle or of a square, is generally taken to be a necessary truth such that you can't have a circle um, whose, uh, whose properties fall outside the definition of a circle. I say circle, square, and triangle, but really the definition of things are generally taken to be necessary. So what it means to be a cat, uh, if you take that to be, to, to be logically contradictory with what it means to be a human, then you cannot have a... Um, Can't have cat girls? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I thought you might say that. So wait, so a necessary truth then, or like an, if, a, if a statement is necessarily true, it means that it couldn't be false. Not just that it happens to be true, but that in all possible scenarios, it's always true. Right. Like one plus one would be necessary, uh, a necessary truth. And that there's no way it could ever have been different. So we're making a really strong claim. And, and the reason why we say that it is not necessarily true that God can create a free creature who always chooses the good is because um, it is because by the definition of free will and of a free creature, we have said that their actions towards the good or their actions toward the evil are both contingent. Um, and so far as their actions are contingent, um, it is not necessarily true that God's actualizing them would In happen other words, that they always do the good. It is possible that they wouldn't do the good, which is the same thing as saying it's not necessarily true that they would do the good. Exactly. I found it easier to approach uh, this problem from the side of saying, what isn't a necessary truth, rather than considering what the possible truths were, because as you'll see on uh, this slide, not this slide, this slide, where I say, it is possible that there are no possible worlds where some of the creatures do not go wrong. It, it's a bit of a mouthful. It's um, got possible in the first sentence twice. Um, and it had me considering what does it mean for it to be possible that it's possibly possible or possibly not possible. Um, that got tangled up pretty quickly. So I found it easier to start from defining, uh, from, from examining, it's like, Someone, someone could claim that this is a necessary truth, and it's a little bit easier to evaluate. No, that's not a necessary truth, um, because it's not built into the definition of things. Uh, in fact, once again, the definition of free will seems to uh, exclude necessity from the good or evil decisions of the free creatures. Like, I find it easier to approach it from that end. I'm, I'm not sure. What, what do you guys think? I think the key is just to recognize that they're, they're the same thing. To say something, to say mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily true that something happens is the same thing to say that it's possible that it doesn't happen. Yeah. And to, just to. being able to swap those in your head makes it easier to, to deal with whichever one makes sense for you in a given situation. Yeah, so consider that the converse of necessary uh, isn't false. The converse of necessary is possible. And, and the, the opposite of possible isn't impossible. It's uh, necessary in, in this technical sense. And, sorry. and so whenever you're combining statements in your head and considering what's logically, uh, what sorts of statements are logically equivalent, Knowing those technical definitions will help you. Sorry, go ahead, Julie. And so regarding trans world depravity, I mean, have you ever heard, I think it's Craig that says, well, there's all these possible worlds, and there could be a possible world where free creatures only do good and there's only two of them. 
And that's not a good world because there's only two creatures. It's possible that there is a world with uh, many, many, many creatures who only choose the good. Um, but it's also possible um, that, yeah, it, we're, we're back to the, to, the set of, to, to the side of the problem that I find confusing. Yeah. Um, so what you're referring to is that maybe God, maybe it is true that God could create an individual um, human who always chooses the good, or two or three. Uh, but in the same way that we brought out free will as a prevailing good, over that, that, that selects certain possible worlds over other possible worlds. For example, possible worlds with evil versus possible worlds without, and just no free will, and just you have automata, repeating code, repeating scripts, um, NPCs, if you will. Um, it, we, we, we discerned that free will was, was a valid, um, Morally sufficient reason. Yes. Morally sufficient reason is the uh, general term that Plantinga uses whenever constructing any defense, um, and even really a theodicy, is you need some morally sufficient reason for God to allow evil. Because if he doesn't, then that would... Uh, going back to... It's, it seems that that would... Uh, causes to say that God is no longer omnibenevolent if he didn't have a morally sufficient reason for allowing evil. I was also thinking in terms of what we were saying earlier that maybe there is a possible world where God, or where there are, you know, a billion, however many, this possible world may be population, of free will creatures who always choose the good. That's possible. But if God were to choose that world, So that's that's actually not that's not necessarily true in that case because what what the free will defense is arguing here it's presupposing the, the definition of free will is that your choices are causally there, there's not an unbroken causal chain from your choice all the way back. So in the case there, um, you. Uh, if God set up the preconditions of the universe and then, you know, from the very beginning all the way, every single, you know, cause one thing after another, all the dominoes go down, as it were, all the way down to your choice, that would not be free. But if God knows that you were, that if, that, uh, if you were in certain circumstances, you would choose something, he can create a world knowing that that's what you're going to do. But that doesn't make him responsible for the choice, and it doesn't make it determined that that's what you must do. Because that causal chain is not. Uh, um, it's not a seamless web. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. It's not a, it, it, it's not a complete uh, causal chain. And that's Molinism. Yeah, yeah, more or less. And, and it, it seems that omniscience makes it to where it, it could be no other way. Um, for for God to to not have that information would be a difficult case to make. But the yeah, but the the argument with with the trans world depravity line of thinking, though, is, you know, you're thinking about this question, well, why can't God just create a world filled with free creatures and everyone freely chooses to not do evil? And there are a couple of different responses to that. Um, and the, the first important thing is just that whatever they do is a contingent fact. Right? Exactly. And so That's the first thing. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they... If they choose to do evil, if they choose to not do evil, it doesn't matter. It's contingent. So, yeah, okay, another technical term here that we didn't actually describe. A contingent fact is a fact that is not necessarily true. Right. It's it, could possible, it could possibly be true. It could possibly be false. So to say it's contingent is to say that it's not a necessary truth, which is why it breaks the argument. Yeah, and, and, and exactly. If you, pol you can't pollute your logical mathematical demonstrations with contingent facts because the whole point of it being a proof is that it 
has to fall. Everything is either necessary or it's necessarily implied. So but even I mean, if yeah. Mackey went back and revised his argument and said it is possible for God to it is it is possible that it is possible for God to make a world with free creatures who always choose the good, Plantinga could agree with him, and the free will defense would still succeed. Um, right, because it's a good, yeah. In, in fact, not only would the free will defense have succeeded, but you wouldn't even need the free will defense because his argument would already not be valid. Exactly, yeah. He, he himself would, uh, would have bit the, bit the conclusion I mean, off. That, that is what he said. Mackey did say that in, I don't know, like 1976 or something like that. I found the opposite quote, so we'll have to compare really? sources afterwards and we'll, we'll post. I'm sure Mackey said that Plantinga defeated that version, that particular version of his argument. Okay. He might have revised it. We're going to post about that in the uh, problem, problem of Evil channel in our Slack. So if you want to continue discussing this before next week, we are going to continue discussing it in that channel. Yeah, um, the, the transcendental depravity claim, though, that Planning is making, is, is all he's saying there is just that when you consider all the contingent choices that are made by human creatures, saying that there's a, set, a subset of them that's all good is just as likely and just as possible as there is no such set that's all good. And because they're contingent choices, yeah. uh, both sets, um, the set with where God has to choose from. Uh, and, and once again, we're saying God's choosing from a set of possible worlds um, in which he has complete knowledge about what his free creatures will do because that's just a subset of knowledge, not, not something he is determining or causing. Now, would you say that you, for this to go through... For you to break the argument, you really need to have a robust libertarian free will stance. Yes. Yeah. Um, I disagree. No, I, you don't. I, I don't think you have to believe that it's true. It oh, just has yes. to be logically. Yeah, possible. libertarian free will has to be logically possible. Now, now. On theism. Now, on theism. Yeah, I was gonna say. Now, as a naturalist, you can deny libertarian free will mm -hmm. and even think it might be logically mm -hmm. impossible. But if mm -hmm. you know, if free will is a mm -hmm a key part of Christianity, for the sake of this argument, you have to grant yeah. Yeah. You, you can't just deny it. Like, yeah. um, and once again, that's kind of why we... Free will doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, which once again, you can say. And, and yeah. some naturalists are inclined to say that. Um, that free will doesn't exist. But... Um, sorry? Even saying that, it it's not necessarily relevant to this discussion. Yeah. Necessarily in the non-technical sense. I hope everybody is uh, delightfully confused so far because it's only about to get worse. No. Um, I, once again, this was difficult for me to break down because I kept thinking to myself, well, it doesn't seem necessarily false that, uh, that, that this is what was going on in my head as I was preparing this presentation, it doesn't seem necessarily false that there is some possible world where the creatures always choose the good. And it doesn't have to be necessarily false. Um, just has to be possibly false. Uh, which given the, the definition of libertarian free will that we are using, and which uh, one last call to, to the Thomas, I don't even think a Thomist would necessarily, perhaps they would, say that it is n that libertarian free will, as we have formulated it, itself is logically false, or, or necessarily false on theism. That would be a rather extreme view. Now, it depends on what you mean by libertarian free will, because I think the the Thomist would probably want to say that God has libertarian free will, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? that's a good point. But if you define it as creaturely libertarian free will, they would, they, some people would definitely say that it's logically impossible for free creatures on theism. To, for libertarian free creatures to exist other than God. Like, I mean, that's basically what the compatibilist claim is, right? Is that God is the only free agent? Yeah. That, that with, if God is sovereign, 
there, there may not, there, like, there cannot be other agents uh, in the universe. Mm. So people say that. Yeah. I think it's silly. Uh, and once again, there's the Tomisk Institute where you can turn to with those kinds of questions. Um, but all of this, I think the one thing you may have noticed is that with all of the possibles and necessarilies, it seems like this argument, that this defense is, um, is pretty uh, sneaky. Perhaps uh, that's the wrong word to use, but it seems like it is finding every crack that it can and um, s sneaking through it. And, and that's, that's what it is doing. Um, because what philosophers have done for these many hundreds of years, thousands of years, they've put up this brick wall and said, there's no way you can get through this brick wall. And we just need to find the tiniest crack through it and there is no more logical contradiction. And the, the reason why we're doing this, well, first off, I w uh, there are still philosophers, um, I believe Mackey included, who believe that there is a formulation of the deductive argument, the deductive problem of evil, which still holds. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to kind of make progress on that. And we need, we need to say that we aren't dealing with a logical contradiction. We're dealing with a full-fledged set of arguments because if we are dealing with a logical contradiction, then we're wasting our time. It's sort of like if we argued ourselves to death about the married bachelor named George Washington. Uh, there was no married bachelor named George Washington or named anything else because uh, yeah, it, it's, it's pointless to argue about his name because we know that no such person existed. Um, so that's kind of the progress I was hoping to make tonight as, as the bulk of our time spent here. So is it fair to say that in at least most people's minds, the deductive problem of, of evil is... Is is dealt with. It's not like this isn't where the discussion is anymore. Is that is that a reasonable kind of average assessment? I know there's always outliers. Actually, I don't think so. You you think that the majority? I the think majority, that not, not maybe not a majority, but I think that there are many people who still uh, who just haven't looked closely enough into this and potentially other defenses to to realize. Well, no, I'm, I'm talking about philosophers. I'm not talking okay, about philosophers. Okay. You I'm said not talking you... about us. Um, Those who have studied, is it, is it yes, fair to yes. say that? Yes, and, and philosophers who are still convinced that about the deductive argument, they're trying to formulate new ones. Um, yeah, but my question was, on the whole, is it a fair assessment to say that, you know, for the most part, the deductive argument is not where the argument lies. I mean, there's some other, there's some outliers, some people trying to reformulate it. Right. But this is the the argument as Mackey wrote it is no longer a, it is agreed to not be successful. Pretty much, and that that's a pretty rare thing that happened in philosophy. So that's that's worth noting on its own. Uh, and also, people might accuse us of having spent all this time here today. Uh, taking down a straw man, but I think that we've also, we, we, we haven't been taking down a straw man because it is something that many philosophers agree doesn't stand today. Um, probably, should have, uh, probably should have opened up with that, uh, but we, we weren't trying to take down a straw man. We weren't trying to, in fact. Uh, so, I, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, if the free will defense is successful, we must all be theists and can never think about evil again. No. <laughs> That's, that's, that's obviously not the case. Um, the, the argument lies uh, elsewhere in, in the current discourse. Yeah, I mean, so it, it seems to me that you can grant all these premises and you can still feel the full force of the problem of evil, mm -hmm. right? I mean, look, there's all sorts of terrible things in, in the world that happen. Why would you think that this is the world that you know, an all good God would create? And to be perfectly frank with you, to give you a, an image into my mind as I was preparing this presentation, it, it kind of made it hard to, to focus and think about 
something like a defense because every, every time I thought about a defense, I thought about um, like, well, that's, that doesn't seem to work in this possible circumstance, or that doesn't seem to work in this possible circumstance. And my mind kept bouncing back and forth, um, and your mind will continue to back, bounce back and forth unless you learn from my example that um, you don't need to worry about all of the different possibilities when you're dealing with the defense. So, uh, but obviously we, we can still feel the full force of the, the problem of evil, uh, and we can still consider it uh, intellectually and emotionally. So finally we get to our last stop tonight uh, in preparation for next week. The probabilistic problem of evil, if God exists, then it is highly unlikely that evil exists. So we, uh, I believe I had the slide at the beginning, um, but now I'm going to uh, read it again. Uh, a theodicy is tasked with explaining how things actually are and is a more ambitious project overall with greater constraints. For example, um, if you're a Christian, then you're constrained by uh, biblical hermeneutics. You can't say something that is blatantly contradictory to the way most Christians understand the Bible to be. Um, that, that would be a constraint on a Christian theodicy. Uh, whereas a defense is just concerned with the philosophy of the question. Um, and I wish I had put a slide in here, but the basic formulation of the problem of evil is that, of the probabilistic problem of evil, or perhaps a, more, a broader category, the problem of evil as it stands today, is that given the amount, given the amount and types of evil there are, it is unlikely that God exists. Uh, the free will defense shows the coexistence of God and evil is logically possible, thus non-contradictory. Nevertheless, the atheist may retort the coexistence of God and evil, while possible, is highly improbable. This will be our focus next week. And then conclusion number three, and this is, in my opinion, the most important one. Having addressed the logical problem and claims of logical contradiction, we have given ourselves permission to think further. And I think we'll end on this note.